Saints and Serpents, week four. If it's your first time here, don't worry about it. This message can be taken by itself. And, and I've got actually three different titles, and I don't really know which one I like, so I'm going to let you choose. All right, it's like the golden corral of sermon titles. Your choice, and none of them are very good. <laughs> All right, and anyway, sorry if you own a golden corral, but you know it's true. All right, so it's one of three. I'll let you choose. All right, we either have the snake's truth, things God hates, or how to have a body like Satan. And we're going to go through all of those. They'll make sense at the end, I hope. And basically what we're going to be talking about today is, does God hate? And Scripture says that there are actually things that He hates, and the word in Hebrew is a very strong word. But before we talk about what God hates, I want to talk about you. And I want to find out what you hate. I want to find out what you're afraid of. And so I did a lot of research on the internet, about five to ten minutes, and I found a list of ten things that are the top ten things that people hate. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to go through them in descending order, and if it's something that you hate, if you would feel comfortable enough to raise your hand and say that. So for you Baptists, this is going to be a great entry level to actually raising your hands in church. Come on. Now, some of you are like, that's not funny. And then, and it's probably not. But I want to go through these. So they go from 10 to 1 of the things that people are afraid of the most. A couple of things that weren't on the list that I was surprised of. Uh, first one, clowns are not on the list. Interesting enough. So apparently it's smaller than, than we thought it was. Uh, one guy that are, goes to our church, I'm not going to mention any names, but his name is Dale Hardiman. He, he, he said on here he was surprised that his wife's name wasn't on the list. <laughs> I did not say that, but Dale Hardiman did. Lives in Gallatin, Tennessee. So here we go. Top 10 things, and again, raise your hand if this is something that you're afraid of. Number 10, thunder and lightning. Uh, and some of you are singing the rest of that Queen song in your head right now. Anybody afraid of thunder and lightning? Awesome. Yeah, so is my 8-year-old. That's fine. Uh, number number 9, dogs. Okay, some, yep, some brave people. I think that was Teresa. Yeah. I won't call anybody else out, so we can be honest. Uh, number 7, enclosed spaces. Oh, no, sorry. Number 8, mice. Enclosed spaces, like claustrophobia, like, you know, like tight spaces. Yeah, I hear you. Number six, spiders and insects. That's pretty popular. Yeah, that was number six. I thought it would be higher. Uh, number five, flying on an airplane. That must be a bit of a southern thing, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, number four, snakes. Mm-hmm. That would have been number one. Uh, number three, death. It's not really death that I'm afraid of. is the dying, but I understand. Uh, number two, heights. Anybody afraid of heights? Me too. Man, I literally make my wife clean the gutters on our house. I know. I'm comfortable enough to say that. In fact, one time I had her do that when she was like eight months pregnant on a ladder, and my next door neighbor scolded me. So, don't put number one up yet. I want to see if you can guess. What is the number one thing that people are afraid of? Anybody guess? You can yell it out. It's not late night emails. He's laughing because he's on staff here. It is public speaking. That's the number one thing. So I just want to remind you, my, me being up here proves that I'm pretty brave. So. The reason I want to start off with something a little lighthearted is on purpose is because this is a pretty heavy topic because we're talking about what does God hate and why do I care what God hates because if I hear something as strong as God hates this, I know that one, I need to do everything I can to eradicate these things from my life and two, it is something that we need to protect and be aware of within a community of believers. So some of you are like, how can God hate if God is love? And that's a really good question. So what I'm going to do is not tell you my opinion. I'm going to go with Billy Graham's opinion. So I have a quote from Billy Graham about why and how God hates and what he hates. It's a little lengthy, but come on now, it's Billy Graham, right? So here's what Billy Graham had to say in 2011. It says, we in the church have failed to remind this generation that while God is love, he also has the capacity to hate. He hates sin and will judge it with the fierceness of his wrath. This is unpopular theology. 
This generation is schooled in teaching about an indulgent, soft-hearted God whose judgments are uncertain and who coddles those who break His commandments. Just This generation finds it difficult to believe that God hates sin. I tell you that God hates sin just as a father hates a rattlesnake that threatens the safety and life of his child. God loathes evil and diabolic forces that will pull people down to a godless eternity just as a mother hates a venomous spider that is found playing on the soft, warm flesh of her baby. Now you understand why God hates sin, and I want you to lean into this thought today is that I believe that today's church and believers here in the Western civilization, and myself, if I'm not careful, we've become way too comfortable with sin. In fact, we don't even really want to call sin, sin anymore. We want to say it's your truth. We feel really comfortable in an environment of sin. We feel really comfortable allowing sin into our home. In fact, sometimes we even pay for sin. And we help continue the type of media that we allow into our home that is blatantly against the Word of God. And we've become too comfortable with it. And I think the reason is, is because we don't really understand or take into consideration how dangerous sin is. I want to show you something. It's slightly dramatic. <laughs> That's not what I do. All right, this thing right here is called a bumbo. All right, raise your hand if you know what a bumbo is. Most of you are under the age of 35 if you know what a bumbo is. Let me tell you why a bumbo is amazing, is because it's like a babysitter that you don't have to pay. Like <laughs> you put your baby in it. And, and, and so I'm using this because I want you to imagine for a moment that this is, uh, is somebody you care about. Like maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a niece, maybe it's a nephew, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a spouse. And it's somebody that's in here that represents kind of something that's innocent or unaware, and you're in charge of their protection. And this is really building off of what Billy Graham said. And and, and I want you to imagine, these are from last week, I'm not going to throw them out in the audience again, Um, but these snakes represent like demonic forces. And we're going to talk a lot more about this next week. You don't want to miss next week. Next week's message is called, If I Were the Devil, and I'm going to talk to you about strategies of Satan and spiritual warfare, including some firsthand stories you don't want to miss next week. But this week, uh, these snakes represent different demonic forces, all right? And sometimes the demonic forces and the spiritual warfare around us can be represented in sin, and sometimes we open our front door and we just allow it into our home and around our children, and we become perfectly comfortable with it. But I want you to look, and this is kind of what Billy Graham was talking about about is this idea that we know that this exists, right? So we're talking about bitterness and lust and envy, and we we put all of these different protections around our home, like a deadbolt. Some of you have guns. Some of you have a lot of guns. (laughs) But you don't do anything to protect the mind and the soul of the people that you are in charge of protecting, and you allow anything to come in. And not only that, sometimes you pay for it, and then sometimes we uh, justify it, we tolerate it, we celebrate it, and eventually it becomes so a part of what we do that we just kind of ignore it. Some of you have allowed sin and dangerous demonic forces around your spouse, and you don't do anything about it. These are the things that God hates, and the reason He hates it is because it harms his children. So let's jump into where it actually puts very plainly in Scripture. I told you it was heavy. Don't worry. I got some other B-plus jokes for you in the future. But but I want you to look at Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. You're going to want to go back and look at this again. It's written by King Solomon. And here are the things that God hates. And again, the word in Hebrew is very strong. It's not like he dislikes it. It gets him annoyed. He hates There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to Him. So we'll explain what that means towards the end. Here they are. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. 
We're going to break down every one of those one at a time, so don't yell at me because I went through them fast. We're going to break them down. But, but I want you to look at those things that God hates, and I'm going to guess that it is a little different than you expected. And the reason why you think it's, and I think it's probably a little different than you expected is because we have this invisible sin scale in our mind where we have this ranking of the list of sins and which ones are big ones and which ones are just small little ones. But I want to direct your attention to this as we go through this. The things that God hates are on the inside. The outside ones, we can get really good at not sinning where people see it. Those are called transgressions. And religious people can get really good at not having transgressions. But Jesus is talking about sins of the heart. So let's break them down. And they're also, by the way, body parts. One at a time, they're different parts of the body, which is where we get how to get a body like Satan. Now you're like, oh, that was pretty clever. Stop. Okay, number one, haughty eyes. Now, I laugh at this <laughs> because, if you know if I'm laughing ahead of time, it's going to be funny, is when I was a youth pastor, I taught this one time. You were probably there. I taught this one time of the, the seven things that God hates, and number one was haughty eyes. And I remember this girl, and uh, she was a little boy crazy, and she raises her hand, and she's like, the haughty eyes mean like John's at school because he has the most beautiful ice blue eyes that are so hot. And I'm like, his eyes might be hot, but so is hell, girl. Get away from him. <laughs> but really, it was, I was like, no, that's not what he means. So some translations, actually, because we don't use that word a whole lot, um, uh, it is basically there are a proud eyes, a proud look. It's the idea that you are better than someone else, and God hates it. And here's why. Because if we are better than other people, then what that means is, is that Jesus died for some of us more than others. And so I want to show you this. Uh, this is another fantastic prop. This is a, t a chair from an actual Taco Bell. All right? Now, this isn't the mercy seat, but it probably looks something like it. <laughs> so I want to show you just a real practical example of what it looks like, though you may not realize it, of how we view people if we're not careful. And every one of us is susceptible to this. Every one of us is this. This is what haughty eyes look like when you look down on people. When you see people struggling with sin, when you see people who are going through a season of mental health struggles, when you see people who haven't yet gotten better at hiding their sins than you have, we look down. And you may not realize it, but it's the, posi the position of your soul. I saw this quote one time, I remember it was on a plaque, it, was, it said, Author Anonymous, and it said, at the end of the game, the kings and the pawns go back in the same box. A better one is the way Billy Graham put it, which at the foot of the cross, the ground is even. It's level. Oh, make no mistake, church, I don't care how good we are at hiding our sins or not sinning as much, we deserve hell. And so do you, and so do I. And so when we have this thought that we are better than other people, then really what it does is, is it elevates you in between that person and Jesus. It's like, well, I'm not as bad as you. And it also allows us, by the way, to justify sin in our life because we see more sin in other people's life, and we're like, I'm okay because I'm not like them. Haughty eyes. Listen to this, Psalms 13, 6. Though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble but he keeps his distance from the proud. That's a terrifying verse. I don't want God to keep his distance from me. Now, James is the half-brother of Jesus. He's a little more blunt and to the point, so are some of you. Listen to what he says, James 4, 6 through 7. And he gives grace generously. As Scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. This is pride. Haughty eyes is pride. And pride is what got the devil kicked out of heaven. And, and the reality is, is that all sin can be traced back to the root of pride. It's, I think I know better. I know that God's word says this, but this is what I want, so I'm going to do it. All sin can be traced back to pride. That one's the one we'd be spending the most time on, so don't panic. Number two. A lying tongue, 
Why? Because if God is truth, then Satan is the father of lies, seeking whom he may devour. John 8, 44, this is Jesus chastising some people. He's saying, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer. He's talking about Satan. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So when you and I speak lies, we are speaking Satan's native tongue. You can see why God hates that. There's nothing but victims of a lying tongue. Number three, hands that shed innocent blood. This one's pretty self-explanatory. All the way from what's happening in the world with sex trafficking. 60 million babies aborted in the United States alone. We even go back to the Old Testament where child sacrifice was a normal ritual of the gods. You can see why God hates it. Why? Because they're made in His image. And they're innocent. Number four, hearts that devise wicked schemes. All sin starts in the head and the heart. So just in case you're not catching on, this is how to get a body like Satan. Eyes, number one, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes. This is what we talked about a little bit earlier. There's two types of sins. Some of you, this may be review. Some of you, it may be the first time, and that's okay. Is transgressions and iniquities. Transgressions are sins of the hand. Okay, if I walk up to you, Kobe, and slap you in the face because your name's Kobe and I hate the Lakers, if I went to do that, which I wouldn't because you could clearly beat me up, but, <laughs> but that would be a transgression, be sins of the hands. I would steal something. I would do something that you could see from the outside. And, then, and the Pharisees were really, really good at hiding their transgressions or just not having transgressions. You can get to the spot where you most of the time don't have transgressions. And, but Jesus pointed out sins of the heart, which are iniquities. And that's why we went to the Pharisees and he said, even if you have lusted after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery. He's trying to say the sins of the heart are oftentimes way more dangerous. So that's what we see here on this list, sins on the inside. Listen to what is written in Proverbs 4.23. It says, above all else, Guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. My wife and I, we have to remind ourselves of this phrase all the time. We say it all the time. It's really hard to do. Just guard your heart. Just guard your heart. Because you can have unforgiveness. You can have resentment. You can have these things that decay and eat away at you, and it's all because you didn't guard your heart. I, I, I can listen to how people talk, and what comes out of their mouth is an overflow of a corrupt heart. And we have to constantly be on guard to protect our heart, or you will become cynical. You will walk away from church, and you will go from church to church to church to church. Why? Because church is full of imperfect people. And if you don't guard your heart, you're going to find some issues with the church, the leadership, the other people. And then you go to the next church and you're like, man, I can't find any good churches. You know why? Because the problem is your heart. It's real easy to become cynical. Most marriages that fall apart, it's because one of the spouses did not guard their heart. So sometimes they don't guard their heart and they think they can find something else that will make them happy. So they leave, they cheat, they whatever. People stop communicating. Communication breaks down. All of these things because people didn't guard their heart. It's so important. Listen to this. Above all else, guard your heart. Because everything you do flows out of it. Number five, feet, feet that are quick to rush to evil. I told you it was heavy. Feet that are quick to rush to evil. This is talking about people, so now it's, it's feet, we're building a body, that have no resistance to sin whatsoever. People that they, they go out of their way to openly and flagrantly violate 
God and his word and obedience to him. And they didn't even try to hide it. They flaunt it. Look at me. Look what I'm doing. Quick to rush to evil. Now the last two, six and seven, they go together. That's why it says there's six, yet there's seven that are detestable to him. That's a strong word, detestable. Because they kind of go together. So we're going to read them, boom, boom, and then we're going to talk about it for quite a bit. Number six, false witnesses who pour out lies. And number seven, a person who stirs up conflict in the community. They go together. Uh, that phrase, conflict in the community, some of your translations say amongst brothers, uh, among the brethren, amongst the brethren, uh, if you're King James. Uh, and, 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 and so, like, basically what this is talking about is it is stirring up conflict within a church. And God hates it. Why? Don't raise your hand. This is rhetorical. But if I went and said, how many of you have been involved in a church and something happened that caused you pain because there was dissension, deceiving, gossip, all of these things, how many of you, don't raise your hand, were hurt from that? And a, a huge chunk of us would all raise our hand. And if you're not raising your hand, it's because of you probably haven't been in church very long. But then if we had a moment of clarity and honesty, and I said, raise your hand if you have been a part before of gossip within a church, of dissension within a church. Raise your hand, don't, but if I did, and you did not raise your hand, but you raised it to the first one, I take you back to point number one, which is pride. I take you back to point number two, which is lying. Because the reality is, is that we're all responsible at some level for it. I have been. I know that's hard to believe, but sometimes I can be a bit aggressive. Sometimes. But what that does is cause disunity within God's house. And why does God hate that so much? One, because all it does is build the, the list of victims. Two, it makes people leave church and give up on it altogether. And three, how are we ever going to win the world that doesn't know God if in his house, amongst his followers and his children, we are in conflict and gossiping? How, how, what on earth would make them be like, oh, there's that church full of people that don't have any fun and have to give their money to the church, yet they're going to talk trash about me the moment I leave. Yeah, that sounds great. Sign me up for that. It, it ruins our testimony and it makes the church ineffective. Listen to this, Psalms 133.1. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. That doesn't mean uniformity. We can be very different and have different preferences, and that's okay. But there's a difference between uniformity and unity. 1 John 4, 19 through 21, this is, this is pretty heavy language. This is from the beloved disciple. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister, talking about people within the church, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. If you go through growth track, and some of you have, we go through the expectations of people who are members here. And one of them right off the bat is that you will protect the unity of this church because you got two ears and one mouth, so you should be listening twice as much. My teacher used to say that to me all the time in fifth grade. I know that's hard to imagine. But the reality is, is that we have to guard this within this place. Not me, us. I want you to hear what Paul said. He wrote to Titus, who was young in his ministry trying to start a church, and he was having all kinds of problems amongst these people in his church. So Paul writes him a letter. It was like the real housewives of Crete. Like it was just this mess. And, and Paul writes this letter and he's talking about brothers and sisters within a church, followers of Jesus, that are constantly causing problems within his community. And listen to what he tells Titus. Titus 3.10 If people are causing divisions among you, give a first 
and a second warning. After that, have nothing more to do with them. Pretty strong. How do you know if what you're doing falls into this category? How do you know? Uh, it's pretty simple. Who's your audience? And what are your intentions? Who's your audience and what are your intentions? Let's say Zach and I have a problem. We don't outside of you're a Cowboys fan. If Zach and I have a problem and I'm telling Hannah about it, who's my audience? What's my intention? And what happens is, is that we create triangles. And triangles are dangerous. Because even if Hannah doesn't believe 99% of what I said, there's a 1% that's going to stick in the back of her mind of the negative things that I've said about Zach. And I've created a triangle. And triangles will destroy a church. But the reality is, is we've all been guilty of a triangle at some point in time in our life, haven't we? I have. We have to protect it. I want to tell you this story. And I'm not okay with this. It's caused me nightmares. I don't really understand why. But I read this, this blog about this man in Australia that had a pet python. Does anybody here have a, like a pet snake in their house, like an aquarium or anything? Sweet, so you're all saved. Okay. And, and he had this pet python. He was a single dude, and this was his baby. And before you laugh, some of you treat your dogs this way. Don't get it, but whatever. Um, do any of you have a, a, a dog that sleeps in bed with you? Raise your hand. I don't get that either. I guess an animal, but whatever. That's your baby, okay? And just because I don't get that, I also don't get this guy because he slept in bed with his python. It was just a little baby python, and, 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 and he raised this thing from... Um, I want to say a pup, but I have no idea what a baby snake is called. No, I don't either. But, but he raised this thing, and he loved this thing and, and took pictures with it, and like this was his pet, his baby, whatever. And, and, and after it grew and it grew and it grew, it started acting odd out of almost nowhere. And, and it really concerned this guy because this python was his pet. And he, 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 took the, he, he took the pet to the veterinarian and explained what was going on. And he said, out of nowhere, at night now, the snake is getting really cold and rigid. And it's like, it's like in a straight line now out of nowhere, and it's concerning me. And it does this every couple of nights, and then it stops for a while. And then, after, then it does it again out of almost nowhere. Like, what is wrong with my snake? And, 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 and the, the veterinarian said, you need to get rid of this animal immediately. He's like, I can't do that. That's my pet. And he's like, no, 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 you don't understand. He's sizing you up. He's laying next to you to see if he can fit you in his body. And then he stops for a while until he's grown, and then he tries it again. Some of us have been so comfortable with sin in our life and things that God hates that we have even brought it into bed with us. And we've nurtured it. And we've allowed it in our homes. And it's sizing you up. And you may be strong enough to deal with it. You may. But your spouse might not be. Your kids may not be. And those of you that have older kids, time goes by fast and the next thing you know, you're not looking anymore and they're left there with the snakes that you brought into the house. And now they're taking them with them. Look at this. Let's go back to this for a second. Sin brings with it demonic forces. And I can tell you that Satan hates your family. He hates your spouse. He hates your marriage. He hates your kids. He hates your ministry. He hates it. Why? Because you were made in the image of God. And he can't look at you without seeing God. And you may not take the spiritual life of your family very serious, but Satan does. And you may ignore spiritual warfare that goes on in your home. You may be like an ostrich and stick your head in the ground and act like it doesn't exist, but it's still there. 
But what happens is when we ignore it or don't take it serious, we're powerless. You may be strong enough to deal with these things in your home, but man, what a shame it would be if when we turn our back, they attack our spouse, our kids. I want to show you one portion in Luke, and we're almost done. I see when Jesus sends 72 people out to proclaim his truth. And I want you to hear what he says, then I want you to hear what happens. This is why it's important. Luke 10, 17. This, nope, sorry, Luke uh, 10, 1 through 3. Sorry, you ready? After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two. How many? Too many of you want to be alone in your spiritual journey. How's that been working out for you? He sent them out two by two. It's, it's very interesting to me. My mind goes to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, man. When they're thrown in the fiery furnace, they're always mentioned together. They're never mentioned alone in Scripture. Why? Because when you're alone, that's when Satan can attack you. That's when he can talk to you. That's when he can tell you lies that you think are truth. But if you have somebody with you, a brother or sister in Christ and in the Lord, they can tell you that's not who you are. That's not what he says. That's not what God says. But we isolate ourselves spiritually. I only pray by myself. I only read the Bible by myself. I don't talk to anybody about this. I don't meet in groups. I'm not in a connect group. I'm not in the men's group. I got it on my own. See how that works. See how it works. And when you come back to the spot where you find out it doesn't work, remember this. And he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs amongst the wolves. It's hard to navigate a broken world and stand for the things of God. It's hard. That's why we need each other. That's why church is important. That's why the list of things God hate, God hates is, is what causes dis division and dissension and disunity. So that you'll be alone. So he sends the 72 out. And listen to what they say when they come back. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. You understand this, church, that you have the power over demonic spirits because of the name of Jesus. But too many of us are satisfied being spiritual infants, wimps that cannot defend our families. And we just accept it. Even the demons submit to us in your name. We're going to talk a lot more about that next week. And by the way, Satan won't want you to be here to listen to that. So don't be surprised if you have all kinds of things that stop you from coming to church. And some of you won't be here. And you'll miss it. How's that for a guilt trip? <laughs> Verse 18. This is Jesus. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So when you and I, when, when we read about Jesus and God and Satan, we think that God's like 51% stronger and Satan is 49% stronger and like it was a tough battle, and then, but God won. Like that's kind of how we view it. And Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. If he didn't even get to finish his sentence, man. Satan would be like, you know, I think I should be God. Poof. He's probably like, dude, how'd I get here? What happened? That's how powerful our God is. And you have that same power authority in his name so live like it verse 19 I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy nothing will harm you do you believe it however do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you he's trying to say it has nothing to do with you but instead rejoice that your names are written in heaven we're done with this our power comes from God, don't forget that. But how do we get more powerful in the Lord? It's the same way that I hear working out is. Consistency over time. Change your diet. Some of you need to change what you're taking in your mind. Change your diet. And you get stronger over time with obedience and repetition and study and prayer and community. And you get stronger. And what it says right here, are you ready? It's going to be super dramatic, but this is what I'm, I've been waiting all week to do this. 
So just indulge me. It says that you and I, as these things are attacking our family, we're vigilant, we're watching, we're constantly watching and aware of what our spouse is going through, what our kids are going through, what, the, what, they're, what information they're taking in. Instead, we hand them a smartphone and say, have at it, stupid. Do you know how many snakes are coming to your, your children through the smartphone? And we just let it go. It says that we've been given authority. Huh? This is as great as I thought it was going to be. To trample on snakes. To protect our family in the name of Jesus. All power and authority has been given to us. So it's time that we act like it. This is the part where you celebrate and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Come on. Would you stand with me? I'm thankful that you're here. I understand that some of you came in walking into that back door feeling like you're not very valuable, feeling like you're not very powerful. But this has been the theme of our entire day today. So Jesus had you on his mind as he was hanging on that cross. You are worth it. You are valuable. You are chosen. And you are powerful. So let's live like it. Let's walk out of here with our heads held high because we are sons and daughters of the Most High King.